neck. There we go. All right. Well, we're excited to be here today. I'm sure you guys are. I've spent my weekend studying, and I just pray that I can not talk about what I studied and stay focused on this. It's hard when I'm doing several, two different, two or three different studies because I pull from the other ones. But it's just, it's always fun to get in the Word and, and uh, dissect Scripture. I just finished the book on uh, the, uh, the 2017 version. Uh, Paul's system of truth and the reason I say version because every year we go through something we have more light on the subject what was hard the last four or five chapters more light came and I thought oh no I need to go back to the beginning (laughs) you know but if you did that you'd be doing it forever so it's a progressive revelation but I'm very excited about that Uh, also for those that don't know remember uh, March the 3rd is going to be the uh, first showing of the shack so uh, somebody told me that Paul Young is going to be seen walking through the crowd. Second, well, that's a, ours. We're yeah, second. we're going to the premiere. But Paul will be walking through there. I wish they would have made him Mac in mm-hmm. that. <laughs> but uh, that's very, very exciting. And then I'm just announcing for Global Grace Seminary, I believe the new counseling course is going to be starting next month. And that's going to be one of my first courses in that. So I'm very excited about that. I think people will enjoy it a lot. Uh, as I was telling my congregation here, uh, my last video I uploaded had over uh, 1,600 and something people view it, but it wasn't me. It was the president and the first lady. So, <laughs> But it was exciting to see that. So we pray over them, right? We, ca- we pray over all of our leaders. Uh, there are some uh, religious establishments in California that don't want to use their name when they pray. But I pray over Donald Trump, and I pray, pray over his wife, and I pray over all everybody that's surrounding him for wisdom and revelation and knowledge to come to them where they can make good decisions. And peace for our country, we need it, don't we? We know the answer is what Jesus did, though. And so we will be teaching that. Uh, This is our 10th session. We're starting Chapter 3 of our book uh, titled Redefining the Cross. The book's actually no penal substitution. When Kay taught it, it, some people had a hard time with that, so she decided to call it Redefining the Cross. And what that means is we're just redefining our view. We're taking, you know, Brother Garner used to say we're taking a second look. Well, sometimes we have to take a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and on and on and on because it, uh, it's an all-inclusive gospel, and it's a never-ending gospel, and it's an inexhaustible gospel uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as I say when I write, I've got so many books, and I have to rewrite them and rewrite them and rewrite them because the revelation, again, gets brighter and brighter. So I want to start out in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 21, and then we'll go through 22, 23, and so forth. But in Jeremiah 7, 21, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices, and eat flesh. In other words, he's saying, uh, You take them yourself, you eat them yourself, I don't want them. And I've mentioned this a lot in the beginning of this series, and we will quite a bit. But uh, one place God spoke, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And what we, the, the, the church world, if you would, thought, well, he owns it all, so he's going to give it all to me. And we begin to place that in cars and houses and everything else. And it's all about serving a God that's going to give us something. Or if we, if, we, if we treat people right, he's going to smile on me. You know, if I give enough money, he's going to smile on me and he's going to bless me with something. Now, we see that a lot with the way people relate to other people that have a lot. They kind of think if they can get close to them and be nice to them, and, you know, maybe they just might do something for me. Maybe they might pay my house off or, or, or whatever. So if we believe just right, then he would give us our desires. Or if we served or we did whatever, whatever it is, he would give us our desires. Because after all, the Bible says he gives us the desires of our heart. And what they, they don't understand, that word give means he places it inside of you. There is something inside of us always driving us up higher, and that's our Holy Spirit. And that's that's the true desire that we should have is to know God more, to worship our Father, which is to ascertain, seek, and desire to know. know. See, there's a lot of people say, well, I'm not able. And I remember years ago driving down I-40 with Melvin Judkins. Melvin was a Sunday school teacher. He had been studying, and he knew a lot about the Word at that time. And I was always praying, Lord, I want to talk like this. I want to be able to quote scripture and explain it and all that stuff. But the the reason I didn't is because I was seeking other things. I was seeking to serve in the church. I wanted to be an associate pastor. Uh, I was seeking to do well in my job. I was doing everything but really worshiping God in the truest sense of worshiping. Because once you ascertain, seek, and desire to know, then you can tell that story, right? 
You know, I, if, if I don't know anything about you, then I can't talk about you much. <laughs> You know, the, the, your true story. But if I spend time with you and I ask you about your life and your family and your upbringing and your, everything that interests you, then I can go to Norman and I can say, wow, this sister is a really unbelievable person and begin to tell her about your life. And so that's why many people can't talk about God because we worship him the wrong way. We worship him for what he can do for us, if you would. And we were taught that worship is listen our, lifting our hands up and singing songs and and you know, giving God, you know, loving God and hoping he'll do something for us. And that's okay, but that's not true worship. Is that all right to say that? True worship is seeking to know him. So that's what we want. So he said, listen, if I'm hungry, I would not ask you. I own all the cows. You know, uh, like Wanda, if, I, if I'm hungry, I'm not going to ask you to do anything for me. I've got a refrigerator. <laughs> it's got food in it. And I've got my own money. I can go. I don't need to ask you for something that's already mine. Right, And so that's what God was trying to get across to these people. He said, if I wanted blood, I could take blood out of my own cattle. But he's saying, I, I never wanted that. So we must know really how silly it is for people uh, to think God needs us to give or offer something to him. I wish I would have heard this a long, long time ago. Because I've, most of my life, I was trying to please God. And in reality, unbeknownst to me, I was trying to please the, the religious systems to do things that they thought I needed to do. Jesus did not die to save man from God, as if he was an angry God. He did not die because God needed him to die. Jesus died because man needed to see a final sacrifice. Man believed that God needed a sacrifice, so Jesus came to do that. So God was not vengeful, vengeful, and he did not have a need, a need for meat, he did not have a need for blood, and he doesn't need that today. I wish the religions that teach people to kill people would understand that. You're not doing that for God. You're doing that for out of anger. You're doing that out of a, a misunderstanding, out of confusion. You're doing it out of a lie. And you believe if you do that, then God's going to reward you. I've always, and I'm not mocking the people, but I've always thought, you know, it's so silly to say that if you martyr yourself, God's going to give you ten virgins in heaven. Well, what's going to happen when they're not virgins anymore? <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it, to me, it's just really silly to believe something like that. But it's a, it really silly to believe the stuff that I believe. And we believe, right? Once you hear the truth, it's like, how could I ever? But it's because we were in a baby stage, if you were, if you would. So he came to give, to, to revivify, which is the word, the meaning for quickness, to revivify or push forward our life, to make us, uh, make us actively be able to withdraw out of our spirit again. That the Spirit of God was in all people, always has been, but it lay dormant because nobody withdrew from it. Nobody made a withdrawal from it. We have within inside of us uh, a source that will supply every need that we need, that we think we need. We have a supply in us that will keep our body well. Did you know that? We do. But what we do is we bring things into us that hinders us. And the worst thing is a belief system. A belief system. And we still struggle with that. One, to me, the number one belief system that hinders us is age. Believe me, that age has a power over us. He's given us the power of an endless life. Did you know that? It's an endless life. Life is always there. But yet we, we have been so brainwashed with age has been a hindrance instead of age has been a blessing. I want to live a right, I shouldn't even say an old age. I just want to keep living. And age should have nothing to do with me. Like Brother Garner said, what does the price of gas have to do with you? You, you know, and well, nothing. <laughs> you know, I thought it did, but since you said it doesn't, it doesn't. Because I've never done without gas, no matter what the price is. I've seen gas as low as 16 cents. What have you seen, Wanda? Lower than that? You don't know. You didn't have to pay for it. But it's been very low. I've seen gas at 50 cents and I thought it was the end of the world. I thought, how am I going to be able to drive back and forth to Chickasha at 50 cents a gallon? Then I've seen gas $4 a gallon and I've seen gas at true. What does it have to do with me? Because I've still always had gasoline. You know, and I, I know some people think, well, that's silly. But guess what? I always have Jehovah Rapha, my health. My health. I always have... A, a true supply with inside of me. So our biggest struggle is we haven't, that's okay, we haven't made a, a withdrawal. What'd you do, come bowing to me? <laughs> we, 
we have a member that came in that thought the camera was on her, so she was bowing to me. <laughs> so, man needed to hear the Father say, who told you that you were unrighteous, and who told you that you need to do anything to satisfy me or to please me? And so, learning that we have always been righteous is part uh, of, uh, of what the cross of Calvary reveals to us, is the love of God. Jesus coming with the love of God. God did not want to leave us in the state that man was in. I was talking to Butch yesterday, and he quoted that verse that I talk about often, is that Jesus came to restore that which was lost, and people think that means lost people. But know that what was lost was man's awareness of God. What was lost was, I mean, the relationship with God. Uh, a little shallow explanation of that is, but my son and my daughter-in-law and, and four of my grandkids are in, in Florida. So I've lost the ability to see them every day or every year. We haven't seen them in over four years, you know. And if they would move back here or if we would move there, that which was lost would be restored, right? We would be able to be with each other and fellowship with each other. And so man had this perception of total separation from God and always trying to reach God. Jesus came to restore that and to realize that God never left us ever. God, God's Holy Spirit is God and God has always been in man. Would you agree with that? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Well, does that mean he's here walking around me to bless me? No, it means he's part of me. Like my, my, again, my son, my daughters, I, I, Roy Richmond, my DNA can never leave them. It can, they can't get out of it. They can't get away with it because mine and Donna's DNA is in them and it will forever be in them, whether they ever realize it or not. Our, our, uh, our love for them is always there. It'll never leave them. There's nothing my son can do. Now they can make me mad, you know, my daughter can make me mad, but I'm never not going to love them. I'm never ever going to not love them. So let's go to Jeremiah 7.22 now. Jeremiah 7.22 For I did not speak to your fathers, nor did I command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Isn't that amazing? He brought them out of Egypt where they sacrificed uh, to, to uh, sacrifice animals, sacrifice people, and he said, I did not speak to you concerning burnt offerings and all that, and yet we thought he did. And I like this in verse 23, but I did say this, obey my voice. Now, does anybody remember what I said last week, the word obey means? Anybody remember? You better be careful, I'm going to do like Brother Garner and close my Bible and go home. <laughs> Obey means to intellig intelligently listen and to be able to repeat what you heard. I've heard that last I know you remember that. <laughs> I should have said, I'm getting ready to ask you a question. Oh, Barbara. So obey means to intelligently listen and to be able to repeat what was said. Don't you wish your children would have done that as they were growing up? Mm -hmm. to don't you wish you did that while you were in school? Don't you wish you did that when you listen when it was listening to your parents? You know, many people will look at you while you're talking and not hear a word you say. <laughs> Women are really bad at that, right, Carl? <laughs> they always accuse us of that. <laughs> but I've done that with Donna. I've been driving down the street. I've been shaking my head, uh-huh, because she's over there making noise, you know, and I know she's talking to me, but I didn't hear a word she said. And I'll say, well, well, wait a minute, what did you say? And she said, you're not listening to me. I said, yeah, I am, but I wasn't intelligently listening. I wasn't putting all my focus on what was being said. So when you don't intelligently listen to the voice of the Spirit within inside of you, what you hear is what other people are saying that is an untruth. It's not God speaking. Not everybody that says God told me really heard God. Because I thought God told me once to let my house be repossessed so I could go live next door to Full Gospel Assembly and be a full-time associate pastor. But it wasn't God, it was me. It, it, was, it was what I wanted and it was my brain saying that this is a good idea. Right? And a good idea is what, where you get the land beast and the sea beast in the book of Revelation. It's good ideas and concepts from the cosmos system. And so it's important for us to hear his voice to 
to listen to him intelligently and to be able to say what he says. So next Sunday, you need to, or this Sunday, you need to listen to what God's saying to me intelligently. So next Sunday, when I ask you, you can say, you said this, Pastor. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Amen. Thank you, my wife. And he said, so if you'll do this, then I will be your God. See, he is your God. But if you don't do this, then who's your God? Your God is your conscious awareness. Your God is the voice that comes from the world. Because we spend more time listening to what that said than we do with what God says. It's a big... Uh, the, the, the good fight of faith, to me, is paying attention to what God's saying instead of putting my faith in what's going on in the world today. Yes. Because if we put all of our faith in what's going on in the United States of America, we would think it's gloom and doom, despair, and we're going under. But God's bringing us to an expected end. What is that expected end? Us fully living as Christ the new man. Amen. The whole earth not just been filled with God's glory because the whole earth already is, but literally a seen God's glory. Amen. How hard is it to look at a person that's done something despicable and see God in them? Very hard. In the beginning, when I really begin to wake up to these things, and I made the statement that Hitler is with God. Saddam Hussein is with God. Timothy McVeigh is with God. It really was hard for people. I would have people write to me and say, I can't, I can't stand to think that my loved ones that have passed on are with Hitler. Are, but I say, they're not who they were. They, they, they have left this body. They have left this natural brain. And they have fully awakened to the spirit, to the mind of Christ. What are y'all looking at? You don't hear that? What is it? Thunder? <laughs> No, no, it's somebody's radio. Oh, yeah, somebody yes. out drove by with a real loud. Lord help their ears. <laughs> so this is important again to say, but I did say this, listen to me intelligently, pay attention to me, and then I will be your God. Greater is the one that's within you, which is your Holy Spirit, which is God, which is the voice of God, and it's the voice that Jesus listened to in his earth walk when he said, I don't do anything that I don't hear, say anything I don't hear my father say. I don't do anything that I don't see my father do, right? He said that. So that's greater than that voice that comes from your conscious awareness that's into the world. And I explained this, I don't know if I did last week, but the diff in, in your brain, and I'm not intellectually intelligent about the brain, but there's a part of your brain, and it may be what's the subconscious, that deals with your digestive system and your heart and your circular, circulatory system and all the other systems in the Bible and body and it keeps it going. Do you ever think about that? No, you don't control that, do you? Now you do, your brain, but you don't sit there and think, hey, heartbeat, heartbeat, heartbeat. Okay, lung, take a breath. It just does it and the brain's what's doing it, but then there's a part of you that dwells on the outward realm and to me that's your conscious awareness. It's what my sense realm sees, my, what I see with my eyes, what I taste, what I smell, what I feel. That's my conscious awareness, if you would. And it's what I dwell on all the time in the outward realm. So that's the he that's within the cosmos system. And so there again, God said, if you'll listen to me, I'll be your God. Because there's many things that's been our God, right? Many false perceptions of God. And then he said, and you shall be my people and walk you in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well unto you. That's what God wants for people, that it may be well. You know, we sing that song, it is well within my soul. Well, is it really? <laughs> you know, is that maybe a wish? Because I see people when they sing that, I see people crying, I've done it. And sometimes those, are, those tears are, I want it to be well. I hope it will be well. But it's such a simple thing. Listen to the voice of the Spirit and obey the a voice of the Spirit by intelligently listening and being able to follow the instructions. And that is what will make it well within your soul. That's what will cause you to live life and life abundantly. Then God can be your God. You don't have to wish that He would be your God. Yes. Amen? So He's saying, that is what I said unto you. Learn how to treat people. How to hear my voice. Love one another. Learn how to walk in my ways. Not, not in my acts, but in my ways. Don't, don't be looking for me to do something to prove myself to you, but walk in my ways. And what are his ways again? Unconditional love. And living out those attributes I talked about last week. Patience, kindness, self-control. Uh, all the attributes of love. And I, again, I say if we would do that, what a difference it would make in this world. Come to know God intimately. You know, I say this for people... Uh, I hope I'm not too close to the camera. Eric Burrs told me I need to get closer. The only thing about that is like you're looking, 
at my belly, and I don't like that scene on here. <laughs> I, I usually get down here like this and try to hide. <laughs> but that's all right. But if, if you come to know God, do, do, you, you got to ask yourself, do you really know your Father in an intimate way? So much so that in a crowd, and you hear that voice of God, you, you, you recognize it and you pay attention to it. When you're, when you're driving down the street and you hear, no, don't go that way, do you listen to it? And, and are you able to repeat, you know, I'm not supposed to go that way, or maybe I need to stop over here. There's all kinds of direction that comes from our spirit that literally can be our guide all through life and can protect us and it can keep us from harm. Yes. You know, I've told people many times, just because you had a flat is not necessarily a, good, a bad thing. You know, just because, just because there's a traffic jam and you're not able to get there as fast, it may not be a bad thing. If that hadn't happened and you were going as fast as you wanted to, you may have had an instant where a truck hits you or whatever. You know, and that's why it's important to constantly listen to our spirit. And I believe our spirit can be our guide. I believe it's not necessarily fear, but I believe there can be something come up with inside of us that's not peace and say, you know what, I'm not going to go on that trip. I've told you a story about one of our friends that felt in the spirit he shouldn't go to a funeral. And then he turned around and did. Left his wife, went anyways. And coming back, a, a, a gas truck hit him and he burned bad. And he ended up dying. But if he would have listened and intelligently, you know, God, I don't necessarily understand why you're saying this, but I know it's your voice. Yes. How many times has God spoken to you and you, you rationalize, oh, that's not God, that's silly. Why would God tell me not to go to a funeral? You know, why would God... Well, you don't have to know why. Amen. You just listen to that voice. Then, if we realize, if we do that way, and we seek God intimately, then we find out that He's always loved us. And not just us, but everybody. And if we realize that He's always loved everybody, then how are we going to treat those people? There are brothers, there are sisters, we still love them unconditionally. No matter what. So once one is aware of our Father Creator's love, then he and she becomes the expression of that and all of our dealings. Everywhere we go, people experience the love of God. Like Melanie. Yes. <laughs> Everywhere she goes, what do people experience from her? Joy. Love and joy. You know, she was calling me one day telling me how, uh, you know, she never met a person like me. You know, and telling me why. And I said, Melanie, I've never met a person like you hardly. <laughs> that, that we miss her here. You know, everywhere she goes, the lambs follow. <laughs> no, people want to be around her because she lets the love of God flow through her and brings joy in her life. Don't tell her I said that, though. So. <laughs> She'll probably hear this. So, uh, we will function with joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance and that's the true attributes that we have it's the true attributes of our father and so if we are of him of of is our source then that's our true attributes barbara and anything other than that we must cast down that vain imagination how many times have you heard people say well that's just the way i am no it's not you're believing a lie you're you're not angry you're not mean you're not cynical you're not bitter you're not bashful you're none of that. It's just what's been told about you and you believe the lie. I have a whole family that's that way, that all their life they've been told they're bashful, they've got attention deficit syndrome, they've got all this stuff, and guess how they live today? They live the way they've been told, and they believed it. Don't believe if See, but if you don't know who you are, then you can believe the lie. And that's why the majority of us, most of our life, have believed we're just sinners saved by grace. And we have to sin a little bit every day. <laughs> right? So we must know if our premise is wrong. If our premise is wrong, how can a house stand? A premise is an initial statement. It's, it's something we say about ourselves. It's something that we say about God. Assume to induce or justify a conclusion. And there are many people out there today that have the wrong premise. And so they justify their conclusions even though their conclusions are completely wrong. I put a lot of... Uh, post on oh, yesterday Friday and, and translating scripture and truth at God and one particular person uh, their premise was way off and they justified their conclusion that I was stupid 
And then I was, it just, he said all kinds of stuff to me in a private message, and he said it on a Facebook post, and I'm sorry for him. You know, I'm not angry with him whatsoever, but somebody asked me why I blocked him. I said, because you don't have to put up with that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to say people on Facebook, if you're following people on, on Facebook and you don't like what they say and it offends you and you get mad, block them. Don't follow them. You know, you don't, I'm not out there trying to convince everybody. I'm after people who are hungry for truth. Yes. I'm after people who are sick and tired of religion and tradition that's yes. robbed us of who we are and robbed us of our life. And so the proper foundation is not penal substitutionary atonement. The proper foundation is knowing that God never needed Jesus to go to the cross. He allowed Jesus to. He gave the decision to Jesus. He, he wanted to restore. So it says it's appointed once for man whose breath, who, who was of the first man, Adam, to die. Because God said on the day you do this, you're going to die. You're going to cut yourself off from me. I'm the only life there is. You're going to take yourself down to Anthropos life, which will die. And it, then it said, so the decision was made. Jesus offered himself. Thank God for Jesus. Yes. Too many people think that I'm trying to do away with Jesus. I'm not trying to do away with Jesus. I, Jesus was a real earth walking man. Yes. But he saw, he took into himself the degenerate nature activity yes. and he died and all that died in him, and God made a brand new creation. God revivified all men, and the resurrection of many membered men came out of that grave. I don't, I don't seek Jesus today to get him to do anything for me. I don't seek God to get God to do anything for me. I want to know more about what Jesus did, so I can live out of what he did, but that living out of what he did enables me to boldly be the throne room of God and to boldly fellowship with God unashamedly. Amen. That's what I'm trying to teach people. I'm trying to teach people that I don't have to pray and ask God to do anything. I listen to my spirit. The only thing I ask God for is to help me to know Him more and to help other people to know you more. Help other people to wake up that they have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And He's doing that in our Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. And he's doing that by sending us comforters, which are teachers and explainers of truth that can lead us and guide us into things of Jesus so we can see who we are. Yes. So I don't need Mary to pray to Jesus to see if Jesus can get God to do something for me. And I'm not making fun of you Catholics because we do the same thing. Quote, Christians have prayed to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you do this? Jesus, bless me. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, do this. Jesus, do that. Not knowing that we have the very God of the universe inside of us. Not knowing that we have His mind and we communicate with Him all the time. And He's told us, you have everything you're asking me for. Yes. So what we do is say, Father, I believe your word and by faith, I'm making a withdrawal on the life that's inside of me. By faith, I'm making a withdrawal on you, my health. I'm making a withdrawal on my eternal supply. And by faith, I am not going to live in the need realm. I'm going to rise up in the no need realm that I have no needs whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yes. That could preach. <laughs> so the foundation is Jesus Christ, the Lord. The foundation is Him crucified and us resurrected. Not to appease any angry God, but to revivify us to living out of the life that we have from the very foundation of the world. When God created man, He breathed life into them, did He not? Why would He do that? Because He wanted them to live. And He said, rule and reign over this earth, take dominion. And here we are, we're wanting God to come back and take dominion. Or we want to earth walk in Jesus. Somebody posted about Jesus coming back the other day. Why did they want him to come back? Because they wanted him to correct things. And they wanted him to take dominion. He did. He corrected what needed to be corrected. He brought us out of the spirit of, of, of the, uh, the law of sin and death. And he ushered us into the law of spirit and life. You draw out of your spirits, you got life. You draw out of your, your five sense realm, you got death. Paul said to be carnally minded. He did not say we have a carnal mind. He said to be carnally minded is death. And that kind of death is just living a life of non-existence. Being carnally minded, you're not able to withdraw from God. You're not able to fellowship with God. But to be, to be carnally minded is death, but to be 
spiritually minded. I lost my, to be spiritually minded, in other words, live out of your mind of Christ. All your thoughts come under the submission of the mind of Christ. That's where life is. So, uh, I got lost here a little bit. Let me see where I'm at. All right. So, there are five places that we're probably going to get to next week. We'll begin to see those. But there are five places where the Apostle Paul wrote concerning the judgment of God and what it really is. Uh, it's, to me, ridiculous. I began to see a lot of Facebook posts yesterday. There's a gigantic storm hit in California, a mega storm, tons and tons. And we pray over those people. But guess what people are doing on Facebook? They're, they're wanting to judge them. They're calling it Lucifer. Well, Noah did not call that storm Lucifer. Just a bunch of people on Facebook did, and they began to, it just began to grow and grow, and they got YouTube videos about it and everything now. And that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's not God's judgment. It's not a devil's judgment. You know, it's just a big storm. The systems of this earth are out of order because nobody's ruling and reigning and taking dominion. <laughs> Jesus ruled, and his earth walked, and he reigned, and he took dominion. And he spoke to the storm, peace be still. The yes. disciples could have done the same thing, but they didn't know it yet. They weren't able to bear those things that he was teaching them. They couldn't quite figure out who they were. And so, we our, our tool for interpreting the words, the cross, the judgment, vengeance, is to filter every bit of that through the love of God. If you know the love of God, then how can you say that God is a judgmental God? If you know the love of God, how can you say that God is judging California because it's the it's the bed of all sin and all what people are saying. You know, how can you do that? If, 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 you know, just like here in Moore, Oklahoma, people were talking about all those tornadoes. That is that shut all the way? Yeah, they're just loud people out there. <laughs> uh, this is Sunday, don't they know better? <laughs> they need to be home rested. But but when the tornadoes came to Moore, there were people saying that that's judgment. You know what's funny though? They never get judged. <laughs> they never pronounce that things happen in their life as judgment. But see, when you know the love of God and you read judgment, then you realize, you know what, that may not be what I thought it was. Right. Maybe it means a decision to be made. You know? And the cross. You, 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 I always thought the cross was the judgment of God. I always Jesus going to the cross. I thought Jesus was judged on our behalf because that's what we... We heard, and then when, of course, Isaiah said we esteem him smitten, but the key word is we esteem him. That's the key word. I never thought about that. God didn't see him smitten. God didn't smite him, but we thought God was doing it. Barbara, how many times in our life have we had things happen and we thought it was God? Many times. You know, punishment, losing our job, uh, sickness and disease. People blame God on everything. We thought that was the devil. Some people thought it was the devil. Yeah, we did. We thought it was the devil. So we get, but, but there are people that say God puts things on you so you can learn. So you, if that's true, then you don't know the love of God. You only have a perception of the love of God. And your perception is, if I treat people right and I do right, then he's going to smile on me. So we used to sing that song at Full Gospel, our quartet did. And that came to our memory the other day because we love that song, but it's not true. I treat people right because of who I am. He's still smiling on me whether I do or I don't. You know, I'm sure God's heart can be saddened, and it is because the world's not living out of who they are. Just like my children, I've taught them a lot of things, and if I have one or two that's not living out of what I, I'm sad that they're not doing it. I'm sad that they're having struggles. I tried to teach my children there's a pathway that I went down that was destruction, and you shouldn't take that pathway. It was refinancing, right? It was borrowing money from the for 28% interest. It was buying something that I didn't really need because I wanted to be like the Joneses. You know, all that stuff. I went down that path and it caused me much destruction. It caused me grinding my teeth. It caused all kinds of problems. Don't go that way. Wait until you have the money to buy something. That's just a simple example there. And so... If we don't filter it through the love of God, then we get off in left field and we distort the gospel. And many people are caught up in this predestination. They're caught up in the sovereignty of God. They're caught up in hellfire and people getting scorched endlessly, endlessly because they have a false perception of God and they have been taught wrong. Those are considered by them to be realities because they don't filter love 
Everything that we think about God, when we read the Bible, whatever, it must come through the love of God. But do you know the love of God? You know, John Cahill used to quote, you know the love of God that though he was very, very rich that he became very, very poor, that through him we might become rich. You know, of course, a lot of people think that means money, but what John, what that's saying is understanding, rich in understanding, not being poor in understanding, but rich in understanding. But still then, how many people knew what the love of God was? You know, when you quote that to people, they, most people don't know what the love of God is because they still see him as a, a needing appeasement. They still see him as needing me to give enough money to satisfy him, give enough service to satisfy him, whatever. Memorize enough scriptures. You know, it, it's just crazy. So, uh, the judgment of God, our, our, our tool for interpreting these things, is nothing but love. So, those are considered here. Uh, again, uh, God was Yahweh, right? God is Yahweh, uh, the lawgiver. They think he was a lawgiver. They think he was a harsh God. And they think that he was a, a, a harsh taskmaster. And they think that all the stuff that Moses came down and gave, gave uh, came directly from God. But it came from his perception yes. of God. Moses was what? After, they, after he came down and they built that sacrifice, Moses was angry. Was he not? Mm -hmm. Not God. Moses was angry. So, Norma, if you're praying for me, and you're really angry with me, and you're mad at me, and I'm not doing what you want me to do, then you go and pray for me. What you hear may not be God. Right? You may hear, well, just leave that place. You may hear, well, you need to call people and start praying for Roy. You know, I had a person after we uh, was at Destiny Life Center that had a lot of struggles with what we taught but they didn't come all the time to hear the reason they didn't come here to hear the explanation and he they told me that he was praying for me and god told him to write a letter and send to everybody that had anything to do with me and warn them about me do you think god said that i don't think god said that 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 was his own perception and it caused a separation and we haven't seen him for several years now and and i understand i love him still if I see them out in public, I have this desire to fellowship with them. I miss them so much. But their perception robbed them of a relationship with me, robbed them of coming along and listening to the explanation. And I believe the spouse even wanted to hear it, but because of that person's perception. So we many times say, God said this and God said that, and God did not say it. If God is pure love, would he tell you to write a letter and just name me? No. So... So we have not been taught the love of God. No, it's been a conditional love. Yes. I hate to tell examples like that, but you know what? We need to make life, these things practical. We need to be able to show people how these things take place. But thank God I know who I am, and it hurts for a little bit, and I rise up and I go on. And that's what we have to do, because people that don't know the love of God can hurt you. How do I know? Because I've done it. <laughs> I, I, I pray God make them come to church. Pray God, you know, do this. They're not giving up offering. Do, not, not you guys, but, you know, uh, what pastors do. We, 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 we get upset because people don't show up and we want God to do something. That's not our God. So what people said to try to prove their teaching, basically they bring up the flood of Noah. They bring up Sodom and Gomorrah. They said, well, that was before the cross and that God was an angry God then. Well, God said, I, I don't change. There's no variableness in me at all. I will never not love people. So God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and we'll get to that. Uh, God's not going to destroy people today. The most, in your estimation, the most vilest people, in, in, in man's estimation, God's not destroying them. God's not punishing them. The things that they're going through is consequences, yes. The earth been out of order, tornadoes, hurricanes, it's consequences. Our political system is consequences. Amen. Our country has turned their back on God. Right. A big part of our country has turned their back. And that's why yesterday when Melania, is that how you say her name? Mm -hmm. The first lady spoke in Florida. And President Trump didn't know she was going to do it, but she was going to introduce him. The very first thing she did, she said, let's pray. Did y'all see it? Uh -huh. You need to look at my video that, that I put on there of Donald Trump on Facebook. The very first thing she said, let's pray. 
and she and she had it written out because she didn't want to mess up. And what did they do? They attacked her for it and sure. said she doesn't even know, you know, the Lord's Prayer. Well, if you're going to say the Lord's Prayer in front of millions of people, do you think you'd write it down? <laughs> Especially if you're not used to speaking. I would. I would have it right here. All my notes are right here, folks. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. That doesn't mean I don't know it. But she prayed that prayer. I'm telling you, it was one of the most anointed prayers. I got goosebumps all over me. People started saying it with her. She had tears coming down her eyes. And then she introduced her husband. And it was a powerful, powerful speech. And of course, people that hate him think they hate him. They just disdained it. But you should watch it. Really, it's got like 1,660 people just watched mine so far. And it's getting spread all over the world. So it's, it's awesome. As you, you felt love. You felt the love flowing through them. You know, you know what? He may, he may not be the type of Christian that you want, but I can tell you, I can feel love through him. Yes. I, re I really believe that. And that's what we need. Yes. We need love. We, we want to experience out of, experience joy. See, that's what America needs is joy. You know, the, 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 the uh, righteousness, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. People don't know they're righteous. So they can't give real joy and they can't experience real peace. And even us, there to a degree, we don't understand the, total, the totality that we're righteous because we still hear that condemning voice that comes from your conscious awareness. You did this, you still do that. You know, I read something yesterday that I had to rewrite in, in one of my books and it was, it, I thought, wow, I can't believe that this, I even taught this back then. It was still condemning. It still put conditions First of all, you had to be filled with the Holy Spirit and talk in tongues, uh -oh. you know, and only apply to those people or and only apply, you know, because you, if you didn't, if you wouldn't fill with the Holy Spirit and talk in tongues, you couldn't, couldn't hear God. I used to believe that. And then we used to believe that God doesn't hear anybody's prayers unless they're saved. Well, how did they get saved? <laughs> I never thought of that. When, so somewhere or another when they're saying the sinner, there, there's a moment there where he said, okay, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. So I'll listen to them. How silly we were. So the proper foundation, again, is God was never mad. Never could be mad. Not mad at you. Not mad at anybody else. Not disappointed in you. Not disappointed with anybody else. Why? Because God sees the end from the beginning. God is spirit and God is not affected by the realm of time and we need to get there. Yes. Right, Wanda? <laughs> Where we're not affected by time. We have an unending life inside of us and if we would let it flow, what could it do? Somebody was debating on Facebook or actually bringing it up that our bodies are redeemed but they were asking if Jesus did more than just save our spirit and they wanted to hear what people had to say and there was a big discussion on it and I wrote, it is redeemed already. My body is saying, hey, wake up. <laughs> Make a withdrawal from our life source. Our bodies are powerful. Our bodies can regenerate, can it, Barbara? The skin is supposed to regenerate, what, every seven years? Every seven years, seven. completely. Your brain cells regenerate. Everything's created to regenerate and sustain for, the, for an eternal life. And yet we put so many hindrances there that we don't draw from that. We bring stuff in that, that I think that our brain is so busy trying to deal with all that that it can't release life. <clears throat> we need to be balanced. I keep backing up to the other paragraphs that I already taught. <laughs> it's too good. <laughs> so if man could understand that the many writers were influenced by the surrounding nations of Israel, they were influenced by other belief systems as you would they would even go to that sometimes it would go a long way in bringing understanding of these writings you know when I first heard that Moses may have been wrong and Abraham may have been wrong it's like I had that look like you just did and it's like uh what <laughs> but then I began to realize I've been wrong in what God said I could tell you many many times where I said God said something that wasn't God I heard a part of it, but I filtered it through what I wanted to take, what I wanted to happen. All right? So every surrounding nation sacrificed in their various, to their uh, various demigods, if you would. They were involved in uh, mythology. And uh, 
So if it, it will be hard for many people because they give all kinds of authority to the King James Version. I believe this man that was rebuking me yesterday, and he said he's not King James only. He said, I asked him, I said, so do you believe the King James Version is the divine word of God and only inspired by God? And he said, of course not, stupid. You know, <laughs> but, but then I thought, well, then why are you upset about me translating it? Well, it's because he sees himself, I guess, as better than me. And who are you to do this? And that's, that's what's sad. And so if you give the King James Version of the Bible uh, the divine authority, then you're going to have a hard time with this. But I say this again for people who are watching this. It's really hard to stand in front of this and <laughs> look at myself. I need to turn it around. Uh, <laughs> if you give it that authority then it's very far, hard for you to understand that it's been translated wrong. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, King James was not Jesus' brother. Amen. You know? And, the, and Jesus didn't speak English. No. Uh, the, the, in the Old Testament, they didn't speak English. No. There was Hebrew, there was all kinds of languages that was spoken. And our Bible was translated from, uh, by the Catholic religion from Latin to German, and then to English. And when it was translated to German, it was under the control of the Catholic Church. And translated to English, it was the control of the Catholic Church. Back then, not the church today, but the church is still bragging on TV that they're the ones that compiled the Bible, and they're bragging that Jesus started their church. You know, so it's a version. That's what it says, King James Version. So why do you get mad at me when I give you my version? <laughs> what I call a most holy place version. Somebody wrote me yesterday wanting to know what the most holy place version was and where can they buy it. I've had a lot of people ask where they can buy it. I don't think it'll ever be for sale. I think it's just we've all got to get where we can look at the Bible and see the truth. Have, if you read the Bible with your spirit eyes and you understand the love of God and you understand the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, you're going to see all kinds of stuff that just does not fit. And that's how I translate the Bible. And when I hear the Spirit in me say, what do you think that word means? I look it up. I'm not a Hebrew professor. I'm not a Greek professor. I can't read Hebrew. I can't read Greek. But I have tools that help me translate. I use my PC Bible study. Not a Hellenistic Greek book. Whatever, whatever that is. I was accused of using a Hellenistic book. That, that even, don't even sound good. <laughs> I'm sure it's important. <laughs> But that, that is one area that no one will move on from until they realize that the King James Version is not the inspired word of God. The, 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 the word that came to the writers was, the, was inspired of God. I mean, it came from God, but it came through their filter. It came through their perception. Well, then let's just throw our Bibles away. No, no. It's the only thing we have to look at to be able to translate and be able to allow the Holy Spirit to say, this is what I said. So the very first thing that we've got to know when, when people walk into the church, we don't need to get them saved. We need to teach them about the love of God. Yes, right. Keep your Bible shut until you know the love of God. Because if you don't keep your Bible shut until you know the love of God, then you're going to be very confused and you're not even going to believe in God. That's what happened to my son. And, and they, they wanted to prove that, that uh, they wanted to prove that God was real by reading the Bible from Genesis to the end of the book, but they didn't understand the love of God. I thought I explained it to them, but I didn't. If I ever read it through all the way before I understood, I would have got confused because it is confusing when you just read the words and the stories. It just doesn't make sense. You tell me that God loves me and yet God killed people in the Old Testament and he told them to go destroy all the people in a, in a, in a certain race. God didn't do that. That was man's perception. You telling me that God's going to kill homosexuals and lesbians? That's not love. No, he's not. He's not going to burn them in hell. No more than he's going to burn me for things that I've done that doesn't fit my character and my nature. Yes, oh God, help us. We need to know the love of God. It passes all understanding, but that understanding is your, your sensory understanding. Well, it doesn't make sense because don't I need to do something? One of my friends that came to our church for a month, he just he said, I'll come for a month. But then he said, but I can't help but believe there's something I have to do about my sins. 
Well, the first thing I said, well, then why did Jesus come? If that's what you believe. If you think Jesus died for your sins, and he, then why do you think you had to do something? Well, I just, I think I have to. And that was the understanding I had back then. What a mess. A, bu a bunch of religions involved in this talk topic have really distorted God's, who God really is. We need to realize it was the same way back then in the Old Testament. Now the Apostle Paul, John 1.18, the Apostle John, excuse me, wrote what he learned from Jesus by studying his life. He studied his life, right? He walked with him, John did. John was probably, had one of the most intimate relationships with Jesus. The Bible says that he laid on the breast of Jesus, his, his ear, and he loved Jesus. And Jesus loved, he experienced the love of God. That's why John, to me, is one of the, 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 the best ones to read, because you really experience the love of God from him. But he said, no man has seen God at any time. You know what he's saying there? No anthropos man. No man who, who lives by the five sense realm. That's what he was talking about. Not a man that lives by spirit. If you live out of your spirit, you've seen God. Where do you see him? Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. And then John comes along and says, no man has seen God. Well, Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So if you're looking at Jesus with your sensory eyes, you can say, who's this guy? Does any man, anyone good come out of Nazareth? My wife corrected me on that. I've been saying Samaria. <laughs> you know, you're just Mary's little boy. But if they were seeing with their spiritual eyes and, and beginning to understand who he really is, Jesus was saying, you know what, guys, I've been trying to share stuff with you, but you, you, you can't bear them. But if they, if they would have really took the time and said, help me, help me see. You know, he laid hands on and healed people with physical eyes, did he not? And he brought one guy a little too far. He, he, he opened up his spiritual eyes, remember? He said, what do you see? And he said, I see men as trees. He was seeing, because they were always referred to as trees of righteousness. And so literally he brought him completely where he could see out of his spirit. But, but no man will ever see God if you try to figure him out with your intellect. Your natural, your physical, your outward realm. But when you, when you begin to look by spirit, you see God right there, and you see God right there. I see God in everybody. But what we need to see is God's love and God's attributes. Right? I pray you see that through me. I think you see some of it, but I want you to see all of it and all my dealings with people. So he said, no sensory realm man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He hath declared him. That's how we, we, we saw God through Jesus. That's what Jesus did. God was in Jesus reconciling not God to man, but man to God. Man, man wasn't sure. Man didn't know. And Jesus came to show us God. Amen. And said, so, guys, you need a, re a reconciliation. Isn't that a mathematic term? Yes. It's like God, Paul said, reckon these things to be so. And so we needed to see, well, this is, this is God in a man. And he loves people unconditionally. And he, may, he wants to make everybody whole. And he teaches us how to treat each other. And it's all based on love. Well, that's God. Yes. How many of our teachers showed us God? How many preachers really have showed us God? And I know a lot of people say, my pastor's awesome. I love my pastor. Well, it's usually because of how he makes you feel or she makes you feel. It's usually they, they call you on the phone, they check on you and all. But have they shown you God? Have, have they, in their teaching, have they shown you God? I know people that sit in very religious churches that preach hell, fire, and damnation, and they love their pastor. Why? Because they're teaching what you already believe. That's all they know, and they're confirming that to you. So no one out of any area of any time accurately perceived and therefore represented him truly until the only begotten son was revealed to him. And I would love to have been one that studied to show myself approved and quit just depending on what my pastor told me. And I loved my pastor. I love my pastor. He's going on, you know, his body ceased to be able to hold him. He knows everything now. He's right here behind me and said, Roy, 
I said, I want to say, Roy, you were right. <laughs> no, he, he's just saying, sick him, Roy. Keep doing it, Roy. I believe all the hosts of heaven are behind people who are preaching the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But see, he didn't know. And I didn't know. And I depended on books. And I had an 800 something book library. And I depended on what Matthew Henry said. And Jonathan Edward. Of all, Jonathan Edward preached sinners in the hand of an angry God. That's the first thing that should have made me think, I don't want to read that book. You think God's angry? What am I going to get out of your teachings? Anger. Judgmentalism. Judgment. Punishment. But yet we read them because that's all we knew to do. They saw an angry God. There was no understanding of the correct judgment, which is decision. Wasn't that awesome when we find that out a few weeks ago, that judgment means decision? Yes. Yes, yes. You know, and Kay was telling, and I thought, wow, then Hebrews 9.27 doesn't say it's appointed for us to be judged. Or, I knew we weren't going to stand before a judgment seat, but I thought that they were, right? Before the cross. I thought they were all facing a judgment seat, but they were not. There was a decision made. You want a sacrifice? I'm going to be the sacrifice. That, that was it. That was it. So judgment certainly is an attribute of God. Uh, it, de it decrees and it decides and it distinguishes and it discerns out of love. The judgment's out of love. So when I look at Donna, my wife, and, and her day-to-day -day functions as a, a homemaker and, and my lover and all these things, if she's not doing something that I want her to do, I don't judge her out of that. I judge her out of love. If I come home and she's still in bed because she doesn't feel good and there's dishes in the sink, I'm just giving you examples that people do, and the house is uncut kept, I judge her out of love, not out of anger because she hasn't done all this stuff. She's not a good wife because she doesn't keep the house clean. Or she's not a good wife because she doesn't cook me three meals a day. You know, all, the, all those things. I judge out of love. If my employer comes to me and there's changes to be made that I don't like, instead of being angry and say, you're not a good employer, you're not a good boss, I judge them out of love. And I conclude that they're doing what they're told to do. And, and guess what it does for you? It frees you. Yeah, that's right. It frees you of acid indigestion. <laughs> it frees you of grinding your teeth at night. And it frees you of, of condemning yourself. Amen. Because cause usually when people have been mean and they're condemning you, it's because they don't feel right inside themselves. See, David got a little angry after he messed up with Bathsheba. And David began to deal with people very tough because he felt condemned himself. But as time went on, he began to understand the love of God. And when we started, uh, I think it was this lesson or one of the other ones out, when David finally said, God, this one, God, if you needed a sacrifice, I would have done it. But all you want is a contrite heart. All you want is just to love one another. Hallelujah. So instead of me coming to God in fear, I just come and say, Lord, I know there's still areas in my life that I'm not living out of my true nature, but you love me so much. I'm so thankful that you're bringing me to that expected end. Hallelujah. You know your thoughts. Is it Jeremiah? Where, I know my thoughts yeah. towards you. Yeah. You know, they were all doing all kinds of garbage. He said, I know my thoughts towards you. Yeah. They're love and not anger. They're, they're lo love and not hate. And I'm going to bring you to an expected end. And that expected end is me living out of nothing but my spirit. Hallelujah. That expected end is how God created. God's bringing us to live out of who we are. Yes. Thank you, Isn't that awesome? Yes. That is love. Thank you, Lord. That is love. Worship. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank well, it's 11 o'clock. Do I need to quit? Let's just do a little bit more here. So the issue is what we see as an, as an appearance. What we see as an appearance of something bad because we have strayed from eating on the tree of life or eating of the tree of life. And where's the tree of life that's inside of us? It's living out of our spirit. Live, eating from the, the bread and wine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you would. Melchizedek showed up to Abraham and Abraham had all kinds of confusion. But when he came and he said, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And, and, I, and bread and wine represents the death, the burial, the resurrection. Of Jesus. He told him what he was going to do in his love and his passion. And from that point on, Abraham wasn't interested in anything but looking for us. Hallelujah. The city whose builder and maker is God. 
All his perceptions change right then. And see, we need to have that same kind of encounter with our Father. We need to have that encounter where God speaks to you and me individually and says, I have nothing against you and I have nothing against anybody else. I love you and nothing can take that away from you. He told Paul, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Yeah, but nothing. Nothing. There's no thing you can put in there. Nothing. Hallelujah. What if I don't accept it? You're still loved. What if I die and I never say a sinner's prayer? His love has no ending. His mercy is forever and forever and forever. His love does, and I've said this years ago, God's love does not stop at a heartbeat. When a heartbeat stops, God's love doesn't stop. All of our loved ones that's passed away, man, they just woke up to pure love. Pure love. Go to the light. Go to the light. Well, guess what the light is? God is the Father of lights. We're light. In other words, our spirit is light. Go to the light. Go to your spirit. Job said, my help comes from within. The light of God is within inside of me. You need peace? Go to the light. <laughs> and if you can't experience light, come to my light. I'll, sh I'll light your light. <laughs> Didn't it say he, li he lit the light? I can't quote the scripture, but I know it. He, he, he lit the light in all mankind. That he revivified the very spirit of God in all mankind. Quit going to your natural intellect and go to the light. And I say this again, if you have a teacher that's not teaching the truth, you need to run. <laughs> because your brain gravitates back to that. Your brain gravitates to what you're familiar with, right? That's why people still struggle with a lot of addictions because you've had those addictions all your life and your, your brain, your, your conscious awareness is used to that. And when you start feeling stressed out, Barbara, what's the first thing you go to? Ice cream, right? Wine. Wine. <laughs> wine. <laughs> wine. Hey, there's nothing wrong with wine. <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. But it's just the truth. But if we will practice presencing God, if we'll practice every day going to God for our peace and for our joy, and how do you do that? You go to the light within. You draw from your spirit. And it is God. And you're talking to God. It's the voice of one. And pretty soon, your voice becomes His voice. Pretty soon, everything you speak is Him speaking through you. you. And then you can say, I don't say anything that I don't hear my Father say. And I don't do anything that I didn't see my Father do through Jesus. Wow, if we could just do that. Wouldn't it be awesome to be around people that have been communing with God and intimate with God. And everything they say during the day is what God said. So next time you see me, say, wow, Roy, you're lovely. <laughs> no, a great God. Great God will do. Great God will do. <laughs> John fifty, John five twenty two. And I'm going to close here. For the Father judges no one. Wow. <laughs> Where did we get? Who put that in there? I don't remember that. <laughs> that. That's this is the New King James Version. For the Father judges no one, but He has committed all judgment to the Son. Oh, God's going to judge the earth. <laughs> right? What's wrong in the world? God's judging us. God's sending hell and fire and damnation. God, the Father, judges no one. He's committed all judgment to the Son. And now we can say He's committed all the decision. It's up, what do you want to do, Jesus? You, have, you, can, you can not do anything and leave them in the state that they're in. That's what it means. You can leave them in the state that they're in because in Luke chapter 4, He had to settle two questions. Am I who God says I am? And He finally concluded that I am. And I'm, am I here to go and redeem man from their false belief system? Or can I just stay here and rule this world? And he could have. Jesus could still be here. Did you know that? He could still be here. But he said, no. I'm going to offer myself. He made the decision to do it. And he redeemed us from our false perception and our false understanding. The Greek translation of the above verse is, for the Father judges no one, not even, not even one. Not even one. And yet most of the church world and the religious systems out there thinking they need to judge people. It's terrible. Therefore, in light of that meaning, the word judgment we find is there's no punitive action. There's no vindictive judgment towards any man. For those who say Father does, they have been in 
influenced by mytholo mythological teachings. That's what they've been influenced by. They took some of what was written in the Old Testament and they didn't filter it with the love of God. And that's what we've taught. So what John is saying, for the Father judges no one vindictively, retributively, how do you say that? Retributively or punitively. And that's what John is communicating there. And that's what we need to know today. We need to know that no one, no way, no how is ever going to be punished by God ever was punished by God. Judgment must come to the house of God first. You know what that means? It means a revelation. That a decision must come to the house of God first. Me, my house. Not these buildings, but they include a lot of houses of God. But my house needs to be satisfied with that decision that was made. God is satisfied. When are we going to be satisfied? God is satisfied that Jesus did enough. Yes. Why have we still continued for over 2,000 years to keep sacrificing to God? And yet people do it all over the world. There's, there, you can go to islands, you can go all over places, and you can see stone statues where they offered sacrifices. You can see people in, in Rome crawling upstairs on their knees and beating their backs. Mm -hmm. There are still people today nailing themselves to crosses, and I guess having somebody else put the other nail in. There's people carrying crosses. The list could go on and on. There's people in churches giving offerings to sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm. How many times have you heard, give till it hurts? Mm -hmm. Most of my giving as a young person hurt because I needed to pay my car payment. Mm -hmm. I needed to pay something that I wrongly committed myself to. But almost everything I did as a young man was to please God. Because I never felt mm -hmm. like He was pleased with me. You know why? Because I grew. It wasn't because I didn't even, was doing something wrong. It's because I grew up in a religious system right. that told me that I was just about this big with God, mm -hmm. and I could lose it. You know, I, I would work real hard to get taller and taller. Next thing you know, I shrank back down again. I stole some cigars when I was fourteen, and I crawled underneath a bridge with Bruce Hibbert, and we smoked it and got sick, and I felt so condemned. Mm -hmm. I had a thought about a young lady, and I felt so condemned. That was a natural thought. But I felt condemned because I was taught all that garbage. And we need to be free from that garbage. And there are grown adult people today that their brains are full of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I started to say C-R-A-P, but that's what it is. Paul called it dumb. That's the Greek word for dumb. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, I'm going to conclude here. Uh, I hope this blessed you. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's always the love of God. I mean, that's this whole, whole year and a half. I don't know how long it's going to take us to teach it, but it's all about the love of God. And my, by the time we're done here, I'm believing we and those of you following on the internet, that you are going to know the love of God so strong that everybody that you come into contact with, they're going to experience the love of God through you. Amen? You. So Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the age that we live in today. I thank you for the people on the internet that's watching us, that's part of this. Uh, we, just, we are so blessed uh, in our house to have people that are feeding off our web page and our books that we write and I believe many people have been made free and I thank you for that because I know the truth makes us free Hi. Father we pray over our, our country right now we, we, we should be praying over the whole world we should be a country that's blessing the world but right now our country is divided and Father I pray for a supernatural union to take place I pray over President Trump again and believe that he's surrounding himself with good people and all of our leaders, Father, that they will function out of divine wisdom and knowledge and understanding that every decision they make will be a decision that's going to be good for people. I thank you that his wife is reaching out to you. I thank you that she, she in, in her own understanding and praying, she prayed the Lord's Prayer yesterday. It just, it blessed me. And I believe that your glory is shining forth uh, from our, that system. And it's going to change. And I believe the same thing is going to take place in the medical system, yes. the financial system, the religious system, and the social system. They're all going to come under the kingdom of God. And I believe and I see the end from the beginning. I see people ruling out of righteousness. I see statesmen rising up in every system of this earth that they're here to bless people and not just steal their money and not just be greedy. And we give you the glory for that. Help us to shine your love this week and the rest of our life. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Also, for those on Facebook, you may not have seen it, but I finished the uh, the.
2017 version of uh, Paul's system of truth. Uh, some people call it uh, Paul's revelation, and it's really been updated a lot. So if you want it, you can order it on my Facebook page. I mean, excuse me, on my webpage, drroyrichmond.com. And I will probably put it on Amazon for people who like to read uh, Kindle. So I'll put that on there in a day or so. So I can ship it basically all over the world, I, I hope. Uh, the, the price covers shipping, so we'll see where we can ship it to. But God bless you. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate it if you would share this. More people need to hear it. And the only way they can is if you'll share it through your mouth and also also share my video on Facebook. Bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen.